We are three people on the panel, as you saw in the schedule, just like a few introductory remarks. Myself, Oliver, and Marvin Heiferman. And so everyone's gonna do a short presentation. Um, I wrote a, a few prepared remarks, um, which I call just to recap and compare notes, um, to acknowledge how extraordinary these days are. Uh, in the scheme of things. So I'm going to read the short text, turn it over to Oliver, who will make his presentation, <laughs> and then introduce Marvin. And after we've all done our presentations, we will um, open things up to discussion. So, okay. Um, it's, um, I, you know, I have to say, as I began, I identified so much with students writing their thesis. And one of the uh, you know, the mistakes that are made in the initial draft of the thesis is that typically the writer wants to account for the history of everything that's under discussion. And I <laughs> felt that way too. It's like, how do I represent the tumult and the multiplicity of events that have happened in um, the last couple of weeks, really, when we come down to it. So let me just uh, go through these thoughts and the way that I arranged them on about um, six pages of text. Just to recap and compare notes. Two months ago, I proposed to Ben that someone should do a panel on art in the age of social distancing, which eventually meant me, Oliver Wasso, and our guest, the esteemed scholar and curator Marvin Heiferman. As we are still in the early stages of radical societal change, and continue to face a plurality of unknown unknowns, it's imperative that we bear witness to this unfolding and that we examine the short-term and long-term effects of our unanticipated, alone, together, collective state of quarantine. Staying at home, sheltering in place, social distancing, all are predicated on strict isolation as a lonely defense against the COVID-19 virus, which has proved very difficult to map. Just to recap the last couple of months, in a flash, the world changed, and it continues to morph at such a surreally rapid rate that we're on hold until things settle down. The one thing we know for sure is that no one knows what's going to happen. Can you believe it? The way things were just 12 weeks ago, that world is gone. There's no going back to all the stuff we took for granted. Hugs and handshakes, meeting friends at the local bar, hanging out at openings, taking mass transit, taking kids to school, attending our summer residency and comparing notes on the events of the day while in line for the communal buffet dinner. That's a big no-no now. Forget getting on a plane and for the next X hours breathing the same recirculated air as everybody else. To borrow a phrase from Vladimir Lenin, sometimes years go by and nothing happens. And then other times, years happen in a matter of weeks. We've been dodging the virus for three months now and uncertainty is the new norm. The COVID-19 pandemic has had an enormous destabilizing effect, and it's not done with us yet. Not only are we living through unparalleled circumstances, we are writing the next chapter in real time. Nothing is simple anymore. In those early days and weeks of February and March when the alarm went out, we had no idea how destabilizing the shutdown would be or how much the social fabric would fray. 43 million people, probably a lowball estimate, lost their jobs in the span of 10 weeks. Stress levels are jacked up. No one knows if they'll have a job or if the schools will open or even if there will be Major League Baseball this summer. All of our mu museums remain closed. There's virtually no more metropolitan opera. The lines of cars in the drive through food banks grow exponentially by miles every day. It was only weeks ago 
that makeshift morgues were set up in refrigerator trucks parked in rows in the streets of Manhattan. And we saw photographs of crews digging mass graves. In the span of a couple of months, we lost more than 100,000 people. We have not yet begun to properly mourn. As the medical emergency grew to epic proportions in the Northeast and continues to do so elsewhere in America, injustice has become more visible and more intolerable, not just in the death counts due to the COVID, but in other ways too, with the recent murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, and within a week, the senseless killing of Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta, the lid blows wide open. Both black men killed for nothing. There's been an epidemic of cops killing black and brown people, caught on cell phone cameras, one after another after another. Enough is enough. The swell of protests that fill the streets grows louder and more insistent. We must address systemic racism in this country. Millions take to the streets. Confederate emblems of white supremacy are ripped from their foundations. There's no denying our painful history, the tragedies of racism, the blight of inequality, and our ongoing inability to deal with it. Here are two powerful forces, systemic racism and a lethal virus two kinds of pandemics, an apparent collision with one another, but also inextricably linked. On one hand, our lives depend on staying at home, isolating in place, wearing masks, going out as little as possible. But on the other hand, we have no choice but to be in the street and protest, to seize this moment with our sheer numbers and voices, to demand change. Injustice cannot prevail. The world is broken, writes Thomas Friedman, as a result of our extreme ways and the world-spanning nature of global culture today, which is more easily prone to shocks with fewer buffers to cushion those shocks. Pandemics, he writes, are no longer just biological. They are now geopolitical, financial, and atmospheric too. You have to be in total denial not to see all of this as one giant flashing warning signal for our looming and potentially worst global disaster, climate change. Unlike biological pandemics like COVID-19, climate change does not peak. Once we deforest the Amazon or melt the Greenland ice sheet, it's gone and we will have to live with whatever extreme weather that unleashes. The clock is ticking. Everybody's behavior matters more than ever. Thinking about AIDS, the choreographer Bill T. Jones calls this pandemic his second plague. He asks in, how does my art find the new normal? Do we really want to change the way we live? Are we willing to give up anything? Do I really need the, conven the convenience of going to a movie or a restaurant when I want to? Am I willing to have to think more about things? His recent work, Deep Blue Sea, a collage dance performance that explores trauma and memory in language and movement was to have opened at the Park Avenue Armory, but was canceled due to the virus. He has commented that the work is a reflection of the isolation he felt as a black man, making art in a mostly white avant-garde world. What kind of art fits this moment? Taking a cue from Bill T. Jones, work that asks us to consider the idea of community seems sorely needed, knowing that if anything, much of communal life has gone fugitive. We are spending so much time online these days that the screen becomes a Janus-faced icon of our connection to the world and simultaneously our isolation from it. Our institutions are still grappling with the reality of the pandemic. 
the museums, galleries, art fairs, and all attendant social events of the art world shut down in the middle of March. Some museums have eliminated their education departments altogether and let go many staff as a means to stay afloat. Social distancing might be refreshing because attendance will be extremely limited to members perhaps, if you can figure out how to get to the museum without using mass transit. The more restricted, the more exclusive which is exactly what many in the art world don't want to be right now. Big splashy shows are out. Exhibitions are being pared down, postponed or reconfigured. Travel schedules reduced. Extravagantly expensive art. Is that model going to survive this extended moment? When asked about what he thinks about the art world's sudden bout of social responsibility, Ai Weiwei says flatly, nothing changes. It will all go right back to where it was. Okay, that's the art world. But what about the individual artist? In this rapidly emerging new world order, what is the responsibility of the artist? We might answer that question by saying to represent the times in which we live. To bear witness is a powerful act, in part, because it anticipates a future. On one hand, if we're talking about the potential of representation to adequately capture the complexity of the present, well, that's no small feat. But on the other hand, an artwork or any cultural product will always represent the times in which it is produced. It's not anything we have to intend, but it's not necessarily anything we can control either. What kind of art world will emerge from all this? What art will be sufficient to these times? Barnett Newman articulated one of the prime agendas of abstract expressionism. We used to make paintings of nudes and flower arrangements and landscapes. After World War II, we couldn't go back there. We needed an art that was more responsive to the questions we faced regarding our own humanity. We know this wild collision of events and vulnerabilities we are currently living through is going to have a lasting impact. We're just not sure how it will manifest in the post-pandemic era. Making art is about working through things. It's about creating space for reflection and for processing incalculable loss and materializing experiences. But don't forget, times of great trauma can also produce moments of great creativity as we attempt to process what we've been through. Art can help us achieve new understandings. It can galvanize through trauma. It can offer new views onto social justice and racial equity. It can facilitate challenging our own entrenched ways of thinking as people and as societies. These times are the wellspring of art to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, well, Jan touched on a lot of things that certainly um, I, I will be talking about too. I just want to say, I'm going to um, a, approach this from the perspective of an artist. I wasn't quite sure um, how to look at this issue of art in the age of quarantine. But um, so we, we keep in mind that a lot of what I say uh, only applies to me. And while I might be making a sort of subtle argument for it um, being a cultural condition at large, I recognize that everyone is different, all of which will make more sense when I say what I'm going to say. Um, so as I see it, art in the age of quarantine, art, art in the age of uh, social isolation, there's sort of two main characteristics to it. Um, and one of them I, I really see is an extension of what happened in 2016. I mean, to me, there's, it's a very hard for me to separate um, what's happening now from a kind of emotional um, rupture that happened in 2000, 
uh, in 16. So um, that's kind of one way that I, that I approach this. Um, and then the other way that's related to that is um, the non making art under conditions where one physically cannot go out and look at objects where one can't uh, you know you can make objects and obviously many people are but they're just sort of sitting there waiting for this to pass so they can put them out there in the world again where people can uh, physically interact with them um, where you know I see what's happening now in some ways uh, as an extension of something that's been going on for many, many years, uh, which in the 60s they called the dematerialization of the art object, um, you know, uh, has a long history of, of sort of uh, moving away from physical objects uh, towards an artwork, an art world that exists in a more virtual realm, which, you know, circumstances have. Uh, uh, pushed upon us. Um, you know, we're engaging with more non-physical, in a non-physical arena of creativity in some ways. So for me as an artist, there's these two kind of interrelated things. On one hand, there's this emotional crisis that happened. And then on the other hand, there's a, um, a kind of inability to interact with the physical world. Um, and, and I want to I wrote things too, but I'm just sort of, rather than reading them, I'll just glance at my notes. I want to uh, share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Um, and, and I want to, to the first <laughs> point, um, to the first point that uh, I'm talking about, which is this kind of uh, emotional crisis that, that um, and Jan touched on this some as well, uh, when, when 2016 happened, when Trump was elected, um, I found myself completely immobilized in the studio. I really couldn't do anything. Um, and I talked to a lot of other artists who had a similar uh, reaction. I think there was a feeling, uh, you know, not only of um, tremendous anxiety, but also a kind of a distraction a lack of focus, and perhaps most importantly, uh, for me anyway, a questioning uh, of the efficacy of art making, uh, you know, as in the face of um, uh, this rupture, um, a wake up call, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it, it, I, I put these pictures up, these are pictures I made back in 2016. They were uh, very simple. It was a rogues gallery, a, a series of pictures of the Trump administration that is, you'll notice a lot of these people are gone now. <laughs> uh, sadly, um, new ones have appeared. Um, but it was a very um, kind of brutal, not subtle uh, uh, form of art that I had never done before. It was meant to be seen online, not physically. It was meant to uh, generate money for the ACLU and Planned Parenthood, which it did. You know, I sold sold the prints online. Um, so, you know, for me, that was sort of my first experience with like, ah, how do I, you know, how do you know? I've been I've been sort of jolted out of this um, complacency, and a lot of what Jan talked about, you know, what Ai Weiwei said about us returning back to the way things were, I am afraid that that will probably happen, but I know that there are a lot of artists who feel uncomfortable in times of crisis, um, not addressing that, that crisis. So, um, you know, for me, that's what it was, you know, and, and, and to, to bring that into the present now, I think there is, there is a feeling among artists now that while we're socially isolated, there is a, we are kind of collectively engaged in resistance, right? You know, I guess that's the word that, that we apply to it. Um, and that is mostly done through non-physical ways, through social media, uh, you know, while, while we're in quarantine through social media uh, and, and the such. Although interestingly, the mass protests that have come up 
um, which are in large part facilitated as uh, you know, the Arab Spring was by social media points to the necessity, I think, for a kind of two-pronged uh, approach to resistance that, that, that you can have this non-physical space uh, of activism, but but perhaps you do need um, the physical uh, displays of it. But even those physical displays of, of it, for, for me, I live in the country, uh, I don't want to go to a protest, frankly, because I'm getting old and I have kids and I don't want to get sick. And, and um, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's um, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, my experience of the Black Lives Matter movement was mostly through these incredible photographs, videos, and images that came through social media to me. So I guess, you know, there's a kind of interplay. Um, to the second issue uh, th that I brought up, which, which is sort of seeing this moment as an extension of uh, a general cultural movement away from physical objects towards an artwork, art world that exists and artwork that exists in the ephemeral um, sort of cyberspace uh, of the internet. Um, you know, I think uh, for, for me, this is something that came very naturally. I've been working for, for a long time with um, photographs that, you know, I prefer not to print that exist in, 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 in um, uh, the space of social media. Um, you know, and I recognize it for painters, for sculptors, for people interested in objects. This, this is, you know, a transition that is um, more difficult. And it, a lot of what, I, what I'm going to talk about doesn't apply. But I do think there, that uh, non-physical spaces are increasingly becoming a really interesting, viable space for creativity. There are all sorts of people mining the internet for interesting uh, uh, images, uh, you know, people working curatorially. Uh, uh, you know, Marvin did a great project um, uh, called Seeing Science that existed, you know, uh, as a website first, did later become a book. But um, um, so anyway, so this is just an example of one of these series I've done about 40 of them since this started. In this case, it's, uh, it's built around <laughs> these images of deliriously happy women or deliriously happy people. Um, <laughs> you know, that range from the vernacular to the fine art. And there's a kind of leveling that happens here uh, uh, that, I, that I like. Some other uh, series that I've done was, you know, when there was a lot of talk about not touching your face, I was looking through my collection and realized that I had, I owned many, many pictures of people touching their face. <laughs> um, so what I was saying before is that for me, uh, this is a kind of, uh, these are people lounging. Uh, when I go to an uh, online gallery and walk through those virtual spaces, it's just, it so doesn't interest me in any way. It's, it's so clearly a, a, a Band-Aid motivated by, for, by pecuniary interests on, on something, and it's not a way to see art. You know, it's, just, it's not, it's not a, 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 an interesting place. Um, You know, this gives me, as an artist anyway, all of the sort of things that I would want uh, when I am, uh, you know, making artwork, which is an audience, dialogue, feedback, uh, and um, it works. Uh, these are just painted faces. I'll just show you a couple more and then I will pass it on. Let me see if I can find some. Uh, 
Cowboys. <laughs> and I did I did a bunch. Of, I don't want to go through them. You can go to my website or to Instagram if you want to see them. I did a bunch also that deal more explicitly with sort of life uh, during um, coronavirus. These are Madonnas. Um, <laughs> so finally, before I um, pass this on uh, uh, to um, to Marvin, um, I, I just want to say that our culture tends to set up a binary between the real and the artificial, between the internet as being this sort of fake space. And, and, and we really value in-person communication. Obviously, I, I value that also. But I think that um, this binary um, is not really as pronounced as um, is sometimes assumed. Um, you know, so I'll just read the last little bit I wrote here. So I just want to leave you with this quote. To be sure, mediated communication comes with miscommunication. Degradations in the fidelity of the message, the loss of meaning. But to downplay mediated communication is to downplay the cultural and social possibilities of communicating with those who are far away, to exchange across culture, to send messages to those in the future, to speak to yourself from the past, mm -hmm. and to interface with the dead. That's from Nathan <clears throat> Jurgensen's book, The Social Photo, which if any of you uh, are interested in these things is a, is a really great book. Um, I just want to say we forgot uh, to, to mention that um, Marvin, who many of you don't know, is an esteemed scholar and uh, 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 an esteemed curator. And I would, I would venture um, very much an artist, a fine photographer as well. He's done many, many different projects, some of which I've talked about with many of my students. I encourage you to, to, uh, to look into them. He has a book called Photography Changes Everything that came out recently, as well as Seeing Science, a book about the relationship of science uh, to uh, photography. So um, Marvin, you're up and let's- um, As Jan and Oliver said, mostly I work as a writer and a curator, but for the past, uh, oh, I don't know, six years or so, I've been posting pictures on Instagram every day. And, Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, one of the projects I was working on was going to be a book about Instagram. So I was interested in how the platform functioned, how people were using it to share pictures, what kind of different communities were involved in it, what the business of Instagram was. And so I was um, going to use my photographs from Instagram, which I put up one every day and use that as a basis to look at Instagram as a platform and social media as a, a, a way to look at one of the ways that photography functions more and more. So um, that was moving along and COVID kind of struck. And I and my husband, Maurice Berger, and I decided we would go upstate New York from New York City where we got a place and would stay up here. Um, we got upstate on March 12th, about five days later, Maurice got sick. Um, and about five days after that, he was dead from COVID. Um, so I stopped, um, I haven't talked about this, so if I get emotional, it's just gonna happen. Um, I had, as I said, I'd been making pictures on Instagram and putting up one every day. When Maurice got sick, I stopped. And I just kind of put aside all work stuff and thought, what am I going to do? Because I didn't expect this to happen. And Maurice's death was sudden and stunning. And I was kind of freaking out. So I didn't make pictures. I stopped making pictures. And the pictures I've been making previously were the kind of pictures that I like to look at. They're pictures about photography, how photography works, what you can see, what you can't see, what do you intend, what audiences read into it. 
um, what is visual culture about, what's visual literacy is about. When Murray's died, that made no sense at all. And so I stopped making pictures for a couple of days and thought, I'm not going to do anything. I mean, I was in no frame of mind to work at all. So I didn't. And I was trying to figure out what was, what my life was, what was going to happen to me, right? And freaking out would be a fair way of describing what was going on. And so you know, I was talking to friends and hanging around in the house by myself. And one day went out for a walk about, I don't know, five, or maybe it was a week after Maurice died and looked at a house down the road that had a tree on it with this flag, right? And I looked at the flag, the flag is all wrapped around the little flagpole, a kind of fucked up thing. And it echoed exactly the way I was feeling about things. And I thought, okay, I could start making pictures again because I was in a kind of state, emotional state where I just didn't even know up from down. And I realized the language was kind of failing me. And I realized that pictures weren't, that I could make pictures that echoed the way I was feeling. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to Instagram, but I'm going to use Instagram in a different kind of way. Instead of speaking to people about pictures, which is what I usually was going to do, I was going to use Instagram as a way to talk about what I was going through, what I was feeling. And so with that, started making pictures again and decided I would post a picture every day, but it would be about me. And it, would be, it wouldn't be about photography. It would be about me. It would be about what I was feeling. It would be about how I was trying to deal with stuff. So, um, so I did. And let me see. Bear with me because navigation here is tricky. Okay, good. So I'm going to walk you through. I, over Maurice died uh, March 22nd, and since then I put up about. 84 pictures. And I'm just going to walk you through some of them and just kind of show you the things that I've been doing. Um, this is a photograph of Maurice that was taken at a wedding uh, uh, in 2011. It was my favorite photograph of him. And when I was looking through photographs of him that I had or were online, this was the picture that I kept um, coming back to because it seemed to me to represent him. Uh, the way the way he was. But then I started thinking, okay, how else do I represent Maurice? So this is a piece that Adrian Piper did a number of years ago uh, called Everything Will Be Taken Away. And this is a photograph of Maurice. Maurice was a curator and writer whose work was about race and whiteness, mostly. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background, he uh, did an, a, a, what was uh, a very prescient article called Are Art Museums Racist that was published in Art in America in 1990. And from 1990 on, all of his work was about race and representation. And he uh, curated a lot of exhibitions. He curated Adrian Piper's first retrospective. And, uh, became a friend of Adrian's. And so there was this piece of his, which when I saw in Adrian Piper's exhibition at MoMA three years ago, I thought, oh, that's great. Maurice is in an Adrian Piper piece. When I looked at this piece after Maurice died, it just kind of ripped my heart open. It was a little intense. So I just decided I would put that up. But um, I also decided I put up pictures like this. I was trying to deal with my everyday life. And, and before Maurice got sick, he, like a lot of other people, we started buying up things. And he realized we needed a thermometer in the house because we had one and it wasn't working. So he bought a thermometer on Amazon, which arrived oh, about five days after he died. And that was a bizarre, seemed to me kind of a bizarre thing to get in the mail. And I thought, I'm putting up a picture about that too. And 
And then this is a photograph of Maurice and me from oh, about three years ago. We were having <laughs> lunch with friends at the Met. And uh, after Maurice died, I started going through all of my photographs and was kind of interested to see that even though I'm most, I, I'm, a, I'm a photography curator, right? I was not taking any pictures until 2007 when I had a digital camera for a couple of years and did that for two years and then stopped until I got a phone and started taking pictures again in 2011. So I have no, Maurice and I were um, together for 26 years. I only have pictures of him really from 2011 on, which was a weird thing. So I was kind of fascinated by photographs of the two of us together and what that showed about us and the way we related to each other and the way we understood photography to work. Um, but as I said, I was trying to replicate, I was trying to deal with what it felt like to be alone in this house where my husband just died, right? And being in the middle of this COVID crisis. And so this is the picture I took while I was sitting on the couch watching CNN. And this is like Sanjay Gupta on the left, you know, talking about the COVID crisis and I'm photographing reflections of the news um, in, the, in, in the sliding door at your eye. Um, and again, I started looking at photographs. I looked at all the photographs that people made of Maurice that were available online. So this is a photograph by Robert Giard from a series that he did of gay writers uh, mm -hmm. a number of years ago. And there are photographs of Maurice by Lyle Ashton Harris and uh, by a number of people. So I was kind of fascinated with how Maurice was represented online. And then, you know, kind of like reliving our life together when this was, uh, Maurice died in March, his birthday was in May. This was Maurice's birthday last year. We were in Maryland and this was a sequence of pictures to put it up. which when I looked at it completely freaked me out because it was like watching a movie and it was like he was alive and he wasn't. And then I looked at other pictures that I had taken before Murray died. This is just one night in our bedroom. Uh, we were reading, so it's like a night lamp, a uh, nightlight creating shadow. So that's Maurice on the left and me on the right. And part of what was interesting to me was I was doing this, it wasn't so much therapy, right? I was really kind of thinking out loud as I was trying to do this. I was trying to understand what is this, what, what am I going through? What does it feel like? And then the question is, you know, how much do you reveal of intimate stuff or personal stuff. So, you know, I put this up because I kind of loved Maurice's hair, right? And these were sitting around on my desk and I thought, okay, this, this is like an interesting way to start to think about representation and relationships and a life and death, you know, kind of a thing that was going on through, through my head. But then I also started looking around the house, right? And I thought, here I am, in this place that we shared together and I'm by myself. So I thought, all right, here's the place is where Maurice used to sit, right? That's Maurice's chair in the dining room. That's where Maurice sat on the couch. That's Maurice's desk. Just again, to get a sense of this presence and absence and, and, and try to make some kind of sense out of it for myself. And then I went through Maurice's phone camera and Maurice's Instagram feed, and this is the last photograph he made of me, which I thought was had a great caption. Because I've been not missing an opportunity to photograph something. Mm. And this was, yeah, this was yeah, this October. Um, but then I decided, like, I'm just kind of going through pictures. And again, it's like, how intimate do you want to be on Instagram? Instagram is so much about branding. It's so much about like showing off your, you know, showing off your life or making something photogenic. And I, I was in, interested in people who use their Instagram accounts in different kind of ways. 
So in going through pictures, I found this photograph. We watched a lot of TV and I would take pictures of us watching TV. So this was us watching TV in a hotel room in Miami a couple of years back that I just thought was a kind of interesting picture to see. And then this, when Maurice got sick, up here, I kind of moved into the second bedroom in the house. And then after he died, I didn't have the guts to go back into our bedroom. So yeah, this is, this is me waking up alone. And again, going back through pictures, uh, here we go. This is Maurice. We were waiting for friends to come over one night and he was pacing around on the deck outside our house. And I just thought it was uh, kind of indicative of uh, him in a certain kind of way of his introversion and thoughtfulness. And then there were all of these, Maurice was a very public person. He wrote a column for the New York Times. He had a very active Facebook presence. He was really interested in being, aside from being a curator because of his experiences in the art world, because after he wrote that Art, art Museum's Racist piece in 1990, he was shunned by a lot of people in the art world because he was bringing up issues that the art world didn't want to deal with. So he found ways to construct a career and opportunities for himself to get his work out there. So there's the professional Maurice, the very serious, thoughtful, brilliant writer, but you know, there's Maurice, my husband, right? Who's kind of adorable and cute and, and wacky. <laughs> so I wanted to put that part of him out there, but at the same time, deal with my sense of loss. The thing that was interesting about this is once I started putting these pictures up on Instagram, the audience, my audience changed dramatically. And all of a sudden, the kind of numbers of people looking at the pictures and the number of people responding to the pictures increased tenfold. And so it became clear to me as I was doing this, that this was being seen in a different way by people. It was, it was, it was being understood differently given the kind of circumstances we were in, the COVID crisis, the race issues that had yet to really bubble up, um, the economic trauma. So I, I was putting up pictures about my uncertainty and my instability that, and my grief in a period that I think other people were starting to pick up on it. And it became, I started realizing that just as it was important to me to be talking to all of my friends on the phone or some of my friends on the phone to kind of talk through what I was going through, that I was doing this publicly, that I was grieving in public. And started, I started reading a lot about grief and a lot of people who are psychologists and people in the field talk about how grief needs to be witnessed. And I realized that part of what I was doing by putting these pictures out there, these pictures of loss, was kind of what Jan was saying earlier. I was trying to work things through personally and I was trying to materialize or represent my experience, but I wanted people to see what I was going through. I wanted people to know what I was going through. I wanted them to kind of feel what I was going through. And then I started getting a lot of messages from people who I knew, but more surprisingly, messages from people who I didn't know, who started sharing personal experiences of loss with me over Instagram, which would floor me in terms of the kind of things people were sharing and telling me about. Um, and so then I decided, you know, as I said earlier, I was trying to figure out like, how much do I reveal? What do I say? What do I not say? So I put this up. This was after Maurice died, I was feeling really guilty and felt that I didn't do enough to keep him alive, right? Or, or couldn't save him from dying and was talking to actually my former shrink who said, you know, you, you need to do is write a letter to yourself from Maurice and explain how 
he feels and why you shouldn't feel the way you, you feel, right? And so while I didn't write a letter, I wrote myself like a index card with things that she said, read it, read it when you wake up in the middle of the night, which should help you uh, kind of process stuff and go back to sleep. So I did. And this is what I wrote, which are three things I, I thought Maurice would say to me. So once I did this, right, and got over like almost a thousand likes on it, I thought, okay, I can push this a little bit further, right? And again, I'm trying to figure like how much can I push Instagram? How much do I want to, how much do I want to share about this? Because it's both, it's so personal, but I put up this photograph, um, which completely freaked me out. Maurice pretty much died at home, but not quite. So EMS workers came and try to revive him and almost did for a short period of time and then put him in an ambulance and then he was going to be medevaced. And so this is in the parking lot of a motel that's a mile away from our house. And this is, this is after Maurice was declared dead. And so Maurice is in either in, I'm not sure if he was in that ambulance or there was another ambulance there. There's a helicopter. There's all these people waiting around. My husband is dead and I'm standing there leaning on my car thinking, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> Some of it's funny. This is Maurice uh, at the opening of an exhibition called Revolution of the Eye that he did that was about the history of modern art and television. That's uh, Maurice's glamour shot. So I thought I would put that up there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I put these up because these were photographs, whenever we would go to a car wash, we would kiss in the car wash and car washes make great pictures. So I just thought I'm putting up pictures from different times we got the car washed. And so that's <laughs> what these are. So this is, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, photographs, scenes in movies where they show trains going into tunnels, right? It's like, you know, the surrogate sex symbol in movies. This is, we were, we were probably kissing while this was happening or close to the time this was happening. I thought this was kind of a sweet thing to think about and share and was a funny thing to have a record of. And then not, this, not long after this was Maurice's birthday, right? And it's like startling, right? It's like it was his birthday and he wasn't there. So I thought, okay, we'll make believe that he is. And then there would be things like this, like it was Memorial Day weekend and Maurice loved watermelon and I decided I would go get some watermelon and uh, did and just ate it and started crying when I ate This goes back to like, what are you going to put up and what are you not going to put up? After Maurice died, right, I had to figure out what to do with his body. It was taken to a local funeral home. All of a sudden I realized he's got his wedding ring on. I want it, right? So the funeral got his wedding ring and saved it for me and gave it to me. And so I got it and started wearing them both. This is um, this is Maurice's book, White Lies, that came out in 2000. That was a memoir uh, in which he kind of looks at his experience growing up as a poor kid in a housing project in New York and his uh, awareness of race and and living in a in a housing uh, complex with African American and Puerto Rican residents. They were the only white family there. And so this is this was kind of the beginning of the later period of Maurice's work when he was um, 
uh, really exploring whiteness and, and kind of asking people to do the same through self-examination. The book was dedicated to me. Uh, and here's a, here's a quote. In a sense, I have become a kind of Baudelarian flaneur, the anonymous stroller, the passionate spectator who walks through the city observing, looking for the sake of looking, and in doing so, sees what makes the city modern, radical, new, complex. Unlike Baudelaire's discreet observer, however, I am not looking for the excitement of modern life. Rather, I am searching for the subtle and not so subtle manifestations of racial meaning in everyday life, and in the black, white, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American faces, and in the many more faces that remain racially unnameable, testifying as they do to the historical mutability of race. I am confronted by the limitless and complex interrelationships of race I suspect that I will be looking for these painful, frustrating, confusing, and occasionally heartening confrontations for the rest of my life. Meanwhile, back in the house, right, I'm thinking this is Maurice's office, right? This is a room that he would keep the blinds closed so there would be no distractions when he worked and every once in a while. I would kind of make him go outside. And this was a shrub garden that I planted just outside of his office, which he would never look at. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought it was time to combine those two things together. And, you know, as I mentioned, I was trying to work through grief, right? I mean, you just kind of realize your life is transformed, everything is upside down. I don't know from one day to the next what I'm going to be feeling or from one hour to the next. So you start reading about stuff. And one obvious book to read was Joan Didion's book, The Year of Magical Thinking, which I had read when it came out 16 years ago, right? But now, and this book is about her um, re-examining what happened when her husband died suddenly and her response to death and her desire to believe that her husband might not really be dead, but might come back at some point. And so it's her juggling her psychological fantasies versus the medical realities and cultural and social realities of what was going on. And I kind of felt like I was in the right place. And when I started reading the book, it completely freaked me out and I had to put it down, but I got through it and I realized how amazing it was. So here's one thing. She said, I stopped at the door to the room. I could not give away the rest of his shoes. I stood there for a moment and realized why he would need his shoes if he was to return. Another page. Uh, I think particularly about how these people looked when I saw them unexpectedly. And she's talking about people who have lost someone. I think particularly about how these people look when I saw them unexpectedly on the street, say, or entering the room. During the year or so after the death, what struck me in each instance was how exposed they seemed, how raw, how fragile. I understand that. How unstable. And in terms of that instability, I put up stuff like this. I, this was one morning I was taking a shower and I realized how much I was thinking about Maurice. So I thought, okay, for the next couple of hours, I'm going to take a picture every time I think about Maurice, which is what this was. This is all within, this is within an hour, actually. So again, this became a way for me to kind of look at myself. This was a way for me to kind of watch what I was going through. Um, oops. This was a really weird one. This, uh, this was from a picture that I showed earlier and I decided what happened if I would put a picture of Maurice and mine together? Because when I met Maurice's dentist for the first time, she said, hello, but she said, you have exactly the same overlapping front tooth as Maurice does. And so I thought, how weird is that? And it would only a dentist would notice something like that. So, um, so I put this together. That's me, that's Maurice. Same overlapping front tooth. <laughs> and then I was like startled to see how, you know, that we looked like a person, right? It was kind of freaky. 
key. And one other thing I want to talk about with this that, uh, that I was conscious of as I did this was I was doing this as a gay person, right? I'm putting this kind of love story out there. Uh, and I thought that was like a, a significant thing to be doing too. Yeah. And then lastly, I'll just show this, which I made last week. I, I was dreading going back to Manhattan to our apartment. I hadn't been there since we left. The, when we walked out the door of the apartment, um, I thought we thought everything was going to be fine. And I couldn't imagine going back there and realized I had to go back to pick up some paperwork. So brought a friend along in case I completely fell apart. And this was a shot of just opening the door and walking into the apartment because normally whenever I would come home, Maurice would be standing at the end of the hallway and he wasn't. Um, so that's, that's it. Um, what I've done is, um, I keep making pictures. I keep putting up one a day. I don't know how long I'm going to do it. Uh, the more, at, once I started doing it and I started getting a lot of feedback um, and people were saying to me, oh, this should be a book. This should be a book. And I thought this should be a book, right? This is instead of the Instagram book that I was going to do, I thought this is the book that I'm going to do. So that's my plan going forward in terms of this is to keep making pictures for as long as it makes sense to make them. But I want to um, do a small book of a selection of these Instagram pictures and write a text about photography and loss uh, and grief um, and the cultural moment that we're in. Um, yeah, and basically what's, it, what's also been interesting is in this three month period where I'm you know, grieving, right? The only thing that focuses my day is making pictures, right? It's, it's not, the, you know, I do other stuff too, but like cooking and cleaning or, you know, going outside, but it's making a picture every day. That's like been the focus of everything that I've been doing. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's the, that's the next step. And I, I don't know when that'll happen, but, um, but it will. So that's, that's what I've been up to. Thank you. Uh, Marvin. Um, I just wanted to say quickly, um, Marvin and I were on a panel uh, the morning after Donald Trump was elected, November, oh, no, Wednesday morning. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. And I found myself crying during the panel. Um, so we have that in common. Um, but I want to say that um, Marvin put his arm on my shoulder and it really meant a lot and I, and I and I and I'm sure that we are all now putting our arm on your on your shoulder as well. Thank you for for uh, for that. Yeah. Um so uh I, what we decided um I guess is that we we'd like to take questions, maybe talk amongst ourselves a bit, but like to take questions um via chat and then read them out loud. So if you have questions, I guess make them as pithy uh, and to the point as possible and we'll try to to answer them. Um, hey, I just wanted to jump in and say one thing. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. To say um, that was amazing, Marvin. And I feel like what you produced is a primer for everyone because we all experience loss and, you know, and confront that space of uh, amorphousness and the inability to deal with things. And so um, I, I'm sure I feel the way a lot of people do to say thank you because you've gone down a path that is so profoundly meaningful that it doesn't surprise me that so many more people began to respond because it's your story and also our own stories. And um, so just, just to say that, thank you. Thanks.
Um, so, I, you know, from a personal perspective, I feel uh, that my argument that social media can be a place of uh, emotional substance has been validated. Um, I, but I, I have a question for Marvin as we're waiting for other questions to come in, which is what, and you touched on it a little bit, but while it may be a place for emotional um, uh, activity, it, it exists within this context of influencers and bikinis and snark and cynicism and sarcasm. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. Um, again, I know you touched on it, but um, and and as a related issue, the the comments next to the pictures, how much that did or didn't mean to you, what how much that's a part of what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, well, as I said, I said or touched on a little bit. It's it's prior to this use of Instagram, I was just interested in it as a platform and didn't, and read a lot about it, but didn't follow celebrities or politicians or influencers or whatever I, kn I knew about it. And, um, and I also do a kind of parallel project called Why We Look, where every day I post three links to stories about visual culture and photography and how photography shapes visual culture in our lives. So I was always posting stories about Instagram as a business, as a social force. Um, so I was, I was very aware of that, but given how much time social media takes, uh, you know, and because I was personally following like 600 people and, you know, and, and looking at people, you know, I was on Instagram I don't know, an hour a day and didn't want to be on it any more than that. So that's that. And I was mostly on it with artists, curators, writers, uh, picture editors, a lot of professional people were uh, following me. And, and, and so that was one audience. And then, as I said, when I started doing this, it shifted, it, it shifted. There was one person on Instagram a woman who had an Instagram feed called a deaf, was it a husband, the deaf, a country boy, and her husband had died a couple of years ago. And she was following me and I started looking at her pictures a few years ago. And I was always amazed to watch this person grieve in public, right? And I think that was always in the back of my mind that Instagram if you if you had a public Instagram feed, you know, you you know, you could do that, you could do it privately too. But so that kind of fascinated me. Mm -hmm. um, but but the response, once I started putting up these pictures, right, was startling. And I didn't even realize how many people were responding because I usually look at Instagram. If I, I put up a picture at five o'clock pretty much every day. And so every 15 minutes, first 10 minutes, I'll just sit there and watch and see what happens, right, and see how many people respond. And then I'll check in every 15 minutes or so. So what was happening with these is that, a hundred people would like one in 15 minutes, which was kind of fast, right? To build it. And then it would keep building and building. And then the comments started coming in. And I thought I was seeing all the comments every time I opened up my Instagram account and didn't realize that there were many, 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 many more comments that I wasn't even seeing until I went back to my grid and then clicked on it. So there would be some of the pictures I showed you might have 300 comments on them. Right. And it would be anything from praying hands to broken hearts to like confessional stories that were incredible. One picture I meant to show you and didn't was one night I didn't know what I was going to eat. And I went to the freezer and took out some curry, I guess it was. Yeah, it was chicken curry, frozen chicken curry. And I was going to put it in the microwave oven and did. And then I realized, wait a minute, Maurice cooked this. Right. And I realized this was the last time. I would eat something if he cooked. <clears throat> so I put up a picture of it and lots of people started sending me stories. Oh, I have my mother's marinara sauce in the freezer or I have my husband's this in the freezer. So there was that kind of stuff. And then people basically saying, you know, I feel for you. 
I, this is what you, you know, this is going to be with you for a long time, you know, but, but helpful kind of stuff, right? And so there's just these people who are kind of walking alongside of me on Instagram, you know, kind of following this and, and just kind of being friends in a real substantial way. So the comments are different and, and the engagement is different. And I think we're in a time when people are grieving for all kinds of things. You know, you can grieve a person, you can grieve a situation, you can grieve the loss of seeing your friends, you can grieve the fact that you're not going out to a restaurant, you can grieve anything you want. So I think this is touching on some, it's kind of what Jan was saying, I think this touches on what people are feeling. And that's another reason people are plugging into this. Yes. I asked, um, I had a conversation with a student in the program, Michelle Phillips, um, about who works uh, uh, in Michelle chat, if I'm saying this wrong, but I think she's worked in um, hospitals with uh, around grief a lot. And I asked her about, uh, I had a friend whose son had died and she had posted a lot of photographs of her son's funeral, of her, uh, of her um, you know, really kind of powerful and uncomfortable photographs. And I asked her what she thought maybe that was about. Um, and she said that she thought that it was um, for many people about uh, making the transition from the physical to the non-physical. Whereas you have the sort of, there's the body which is no longer there and it carries on in some ways through the photograph. And it's sort of part of the transition. I think she put it more eloquently, but that's kind of how I am. Um, Oh, I understood it. Um, so we have some questions here. Um, James Porter, uh, thanks you. As I should just point out, I'm not reading them all, Marvin, but there are many students expressing uh, 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 gratitude and admiration uh, for your courage being here. Uh, thank you. Your willingness to grieve in public is healing for me after a recent loss. I think of Stieglitz's idea of equivalence when I hear you talk about these photos, what relationship do you see between your work here and that approach? And maybe um, Marvin, you could briefly tell those who don't know uh, the oh, two sentence definition of Stieglitz's idea of equivalence. Uh, the equivalent photographs were photographs of clouds that Stieglitz made from his window, mostly in a hotel in Midtown Manhattan. I don't know if he made him from the gallery uh, or from his hotel window where he had an apartment, but they're, they're almost abstract images that people, viewers were meant to read into. They're, they're symbolic, right? They're, you kind of find whatever you want to see on them. Um, these are kind of like it in a way. I mean, what I was trying to do was find an equivalence for what I was feeling. I was trying to think like, I can't, language wasn't doing it for me right it's like i couldn't even when i talk to my my friends or you know people who as i said the handful of people that i still pretty much talk to every day or every other day to kind of talk my way through this because again you're by yourself you know my brother might come over here for sit out on the deck you know for a while but mostly i'm by myself so i'm talking to people a lot but this language didn't get to what I wanted to say. It didn't get to the nuance of it. It didn't get to the sense of me in space, in a place, right? Physically where I am and kind of mentally where I am. So yeah, in a sense, some of the pictures get put up to function that way. And it's interesting to me, going back to like likes on Instagram or what audience responses, viewer responses, you know, I have, I can have very personal reasons for putting a picture up and it reads really clearly to me and may not read that way to other people. So yeah, I'm putting these pictures up and let people, th let people think what they want to think. But I also became very conscious of captions. And so the captions are really meant to ground pictures that may not be so obvious, but, um, but yeah, I mean, this is like, this is how do you represent loss? This is not like the 19th century where you're looking at a portrait of somebody. This is me looking at a piece of watermelon and saying, that makes me feel 
both good and bad, right? It makes, it's like that picture of the flag, right? I mean, I looked at that, that first day that I made that picture and I thought, this is kind of corny and obvious, but, right, this is how I feel. I feel like twisted up, like that flag is twisted up. And so in that, that sense, it's, it is kind of like it. And, a, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm as bad as anybody else is on Instagram. It's like, who's liking it? Who's not liking it? And so there's a part of me that is some days thinking like, how is this going to read to other people? So, you know, I go, I go back and forth. Some days I just think, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. Right. And then there are days that I think, oh, maybe people don't want to see this. And it, and then I realized it doesn't make a difference. I'm doing this for me. And Actually, it was interesting to get ready for doing this today because I hadn't really thought how I was going to do it. And my neighbor last night said, hey, maybe you should like go through your pictures and start editing them, <laughs> right? And I was like, oh, yeah, I will. And so that was interesting to think, all right, which pictures am I going to show you guys today? And like, what means what? So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think pictures work on multiple levels. These are both personal and impersonal. They're, uh, they're landscape pictures, they're still life pictures, they're portrait pictures, they're old pictures, they're new pictures. So part of this is a way for me to also kind of continue looking at how photographs work. So, Michelle? I just wanted to say, just briefly, Marvin, the photograph you showed of the flag twisted up. Yeah. Uh, and that, you, you know, your identification with that. Yeah. What I saw when you showed that image, I yeah. saw the flag hugging the tree. Uh -huh. Anyway, just, you know, a lot yeah. of space in the work, but yeah. Yeah. I, I, I saw it as being that kind of embrace that was comforting and embodied in a way that exploration of embodiment that is part of this journey. Yeah, yeah. So Michelle Phillips wrote a question, but I think maybe part of it's missing. I will try to read it though. And maybe Michelle, you can uh, flesh it out. But um, it begins with the word media. That's why it makes me think something might be missing. But media allowing us uh, to, during a most isolating time, feel ironically less isolated. That's very true. Uh, sharing on the Insta platform and communicating visually, allowing people to come together and communicate and heal through an online vehicle. Uh, imagine the isolation of grief without the opportunity of Instagram to connect while in such a dev devastating time. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a really um, uh, good, good point. Uh, yeah. And, and especially, I mean, because of uh, Maurice's I mean, you were tested, but but and, and negative, but you know, you couldn't leave. You can't leave the house anyway. But you especially couldn't leave the house. You're in isolated in upstate New York. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. it's it's uh, a very meta isolation. But see, I think I think the platforms interesting for that, and always did. You know, it's like sure. I used to. I've run I've run galleries before, right? And Oliver, you know this from your own experience. I you know. You could sit in a gallery and, you know, 10 people could see a picture a day or 100 people could see a picture a day. There are thousands of people that see these pictures every day. That's extraordinary. And then if hundreds of them are writing back to me and we're like, it, it, maybe it's dialogue, maybe it's, it's not, it is like a kind of a coming together of people. And this allows it in a really interesting way. And it's not an influencer kind of like showing off kind of thing. This is like, I'm here, this hurts, right? Say something or don't say something, but people do. And in fact, I felt better knowing that people were looking at this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody says, uh, makes the, uh, count, somebody pointed out before that it helped them with their, uh, I just realized I read the question with their grieving process as well, hearing about it. Yeah. Um, well, the, it, it is a space we live in. You know, I mean, just thinking about some of the 
dualities that emerge in conversations about being online and what is the quality of that space. It is a space that we live in. And, you know, I found myself thinking, oh, just as things seem to go from bad to worse to impossible in terms of the events of the last month or two, um, I, it occurred to me one day, what if we didn't have the internet? You know, what, what if that was the next level of cultural trauma and the grid was compromised and the entire internet would, went down? And, I, you know, I found, I, I just couldn't quite imagine the world that way. Um, and so, you know, the vitality, just in this very moment of seeing you, of seeing Oliver, of sharing this space, an experience, I think, is um, something I can't imagine that we could do without now. Hey, Jan, can I ask you a question? What, what, yeah. what, I mean, you're not a critic in the traditional sense. You don't go out and review shows anymore. Or maybe, maybe you do. I do, actually. Do, sorry. <laughs> you, you don't have a regular, you don't, you write separate from doing that. You have a, a critical practice that is certainly separate from that. But what's it like, you know, for you during all of this as somebody who goes out and looks at things and writes about them? Um, I, I, I find that for the first time I am, I'm writing reviews for Art Forum right now. And so for the first time I'm reviewing artworks that are, I'm seeing only online. And I, I realized that my selections are based on, you know, I mean, art form sends out a list and you kind of sort through that and negotiate what you want to do. So the first piece that I wrote online was about Gary Simmons, whom I know and I know the work. Uh, it's a new version of the work. Now I'm writing about Peter Nagy and the work that he did in the 80s, which is kind of fun to go back and look at. But um, yeah, I think, that, well. I think that the, um, our engagement with art is increasingly mediated. And, it, and I think what happens when, for me, when I'm dealing with stuff online, I mean, it's a flat screen. Everything is the same size. The world is flat in this respect. Um, I think that a more conceptual dimension emerges in the work, you know, you, you, unless you have like super great photography, you know, and so you can crawl over every inch of a painting or a sculpture and get to know it in a lot of different ways. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I think I was out in my garden when I was just thinking, okay, what could happen now? And, um, and then that, you know, that's when it occurred to me, well, you know, the internet could go down. <laughs> and, and that would be uh, like cause for sheer panic. And, um, and so I think once I had that thought, it opened up a way to think about this cultural space and art in this space that is so primary to our conception of the world and consciousness now that um, you know, I can't, I can't imagine being without it. Somebody asked, somebody else asked you a question, Jan, it's related. They wanted you to, um, Amy, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Amy Deans. Uh, Hi, sorry? Amy. Dinas, our Deans. Sorry. Um, wanted you to expand a little bit on this, this notion of the power of taking witness, uh, and, uh, she says, "I understand the concept at face value, but would love for you to uh, would love to expand to our MFA candidate to me their role as taking witness." You know, I think I think about Marvin's project as uh, to find a space in which you can respond, and so much that happens overwhelms and numbs, and so you know what is the most fundamental thing we can do? We can, and, and that's how I, I can, I know a lot has been written about witnessing, which I haven't read, but, um, but what is the most fundamental thing we can do to forestall cynicism and defeatism 
it is to bear witness. And, you know, in thinking about it as I was working on that little text, the idea of bearing witness, it does anticipate a future. There will be a record for, you know, those who come, a record of this moment. But I think it's very much in terms of, you know, Marvin's experience, uh, here I am with myself and I must have an engagement with the world that's productive productivity is that way to forestall cynicism and defeatism. Actually, I take those words from a statement from Thomas Hirschhorn. And that's what I think of in terms of bearing witness to, you know, in that train of thought that I entertained briefly in the paper, the idea of representation, the power of representation you know, an editor once told me, you can never say everything there is to say. Not in one piece, not ever. But to, to represent the world in which we live is, um, I think, incredibly important. I agree. For the world and for us. Holly Rain, God, why, why am I doing this? I can't pronounce anyone's uh, name. Um, asked a question, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, just to expand on a little bit, but um, it basically wants to know if Instagram uh, has the potential to create infrastructure for sharing and exchanging uh, suffering uh, versus the gallery space. And if you'll allow me to uh, expand on your question and just say, does it have the potential to be a viable place for um, nutritious creativity. Uh, and, and I think that um, when people talk about Instagram's relationship to the art world, they always talk about it in terms of artists utilizing it as a promotional tool. But they don't talk about it as, as a creative space. Obviously, um, uh, uh, Marvin you know, has made a very strong case for, for it being a, a creative space. But I think, you know, even uh, Beyond that, I think that uh, you just, it has to define its own terms, its own criteria uh, that, that is separate. It's not repl replicating um, the system that, that already exists. Uh, and I think that a lot of that has to do with, I mean, there are people, David Riminelli, the, the uh, art critic who has a fantastic Instagram feed followed by tens of thousands of people where he uh, shows artwork, other people, you know, artwork from history, but he, he curates it in such a way that one day you'll have a certain kind of artwork uh, and that will, um, you know, ultimately in the end, his project is a reflection of him. It's, it's his artistic vision. And I think that's one, one way to answer your question that it does have, where it can be a viable place creativity. Can I come back to this idea of witnessing? I just wanted to say one thing. It, again, thinking about Marvin's experience, which you have so generously shared with us, when events such as the death of the loved one, you know, the cultural rupture, when these things happen, I think you know, one of our responses is just like, it, it's such overload that everything becomes a blur. And so some idea of bearing witness or making a photograph of a day becomes a roadmap for ourselves to be able to get back to that place. Because, you know, we think, I mean, the present, the continuous present that will, we'll be able to remember all these things. I know where I was when 9-11 happened. Um, what happened when the buildings came down, when the people jumped off? But, uh, but memory is so faulty as well. And so I think a lot about like, you know, the roadmap, how, how will we get back to this time? Let's, let's make these pictures, let's write these texts, let's make a time capsule for ourselves. Yeah, somebody somebody had asked a question about forgetting and and the photographs. So. Yeah, 
where is it? Noel Heller says, the yeah. talk made me think about the phenomenology or the contours of forgetting and remembering. How do you observe that relationship? Also have your thoughts and feelings about objects and their relationship with photograph images of these objects change. When, as I said earlier, I was startled to realize that if I had to like look back at the 26 years Maurice and I were together, I didn't have any pictures of the first, you know, 15 years of it. So the pictures that I've got on my phone, right, that's the record of our life, right? And so in terms of remembering, that's remembering. But then there was one night, not so, I don't know, it's like about a month ago, that I realized looking at pictures of Maurice made me feel that he was not dead, that he was alive in some kind of way, it made it feel that he was with me. But what I also realized was I couldn't remember his voice, right? I mean, talk about remembering and forgetting. And it's like, wait a minute, what did Murray sound like, right? And so there, I went on, the, his, his voice is on the answering machine at the house, right? And so there's that, but I couldn't hear it in my head. So I had to go online to find video of Maurice. And there's, Maurice was someone who only recently has done, been interviewed a lot and the stuff's not available online, but I was able to watch this incredible film that ICP made when he won an Infinity Award a couple of years ago and could hear his voice. But I realized that would be gone, right? If there wasn't recording of it. And yeah. so, and, and so it made me think about people, you know, and, and the way we use our phones and the way we document things and, and people's obsessive taking of pictures. And it, now that, you know, as soon as Murray's died and I went through every picture I had and divided up into every year I had pictures, it's not a lot of pictures. And I just kept thinking I would have taken more, right? I mean, so in terms of forgetting and remembering, I would urge everybody to take as many pictures as you possibly can. I'm yes. thinking that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this kind of obsessive photographic culture that people talk about, there's a reason for it. And, and going back to what we were talking about before in terms of Instagram, like as a platform, it's such a complicated platform. I was just reading the other day that Instagram is about to overtake Twitter as the source of news for most people. Really? Right. Yep, yep, yep. So there's this visual medium that we're all part of right that is going to serve yet another function so every the way well anybody operates on instagram is a i guess a personal navigational kind of choice it's a that's what i like about it it's just it, it's so many things to so many people yeah um hey, hey ben uh, i know that we only have a few minutes here and we have to wrap it up but i've been um private messaging with uh, Deb Todd Wheeler, who's on our faculty, who asked a very interesting question um, about uh, which, which I, I would like to invite her in for a second. Can I do that? Sure. Um, let me see how I do that. For Joel or somebody, what do we need to do? Make her a co-host. Okay. Because Deb has had her own share of grief. I like how Jan said, can we then have Deb in? Jan's like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Deb, you got to get out of the garden. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I live here. So, uh, so uh, I paraphrased your question, but you can go ahead and ask it yourself and maybe uh, add to it if you want. Well, it's, it's, um, it's striking to me. Um, you know how much transition has happened in people's practice um, doing things unexpected changing changing what what's going on uh, and and I've been urging people not to try to contextualize it or think about it or edit too much right now because um, you know this is a this is we don't really know where we are <laughs> we can't can't really frame what we're doing um, and I, the question 